this chapter to give you a quick overview as we finish it up today. We first talked about two and then three dimensional vectors and some ways you can manipulate them. The purposes for that are multifold, but for us in particular, we wanted to look in the direction of surfaces in free space. We looked at lines, planes, and so called quadric surfaces, cylinders, solids of revolution, and what have you. I got a list of most of the ones that we talked about up here on the board. And some. In some sense, we looked at some good examples of these, not all possibilities, but these are the quadric surfaces we were de dealing with. This is the one I ended up with, z squared is x squared minus y squared. It's parabolic in a couple of directions. In one direction, it's parabolic up, and another direction, it's parabolic down. And if you look in the xyz plane, it, or uh, pardon me, the xyz coordinate system, it looks something like that, I guess. Not quite. I guess I'd have to label this one x, this one y, and this one z. Looking at it, you can see that z squared is x squared, so it opens up in the x z plane. It opens down in the y z plane, and cross-sectionally, you get these hyperbolas. So that's the fancy name, and of course, what we know it as is a saddle surface. It's possible to cook up surfaces that have uh, more than one little gap like that. In fact, there's some extremely weird-looking surfaces. Some textbooks, not so much ours, but others, more recent ones, in fact, you'll see a whole section devoted to pictures with the computer's graph looking at various uh, strange looking surfaces. So, this is where we stop. I think I'm at my human limitations as to how to draw these things, but uh, certainly there's a lot more out there. If you're interested, you got to follow it up. There are, of course, lots of programs and lots of new computer devices coming along that uh, make all of this quite a bit easier. Notice that we've always, in fact, stuck in the Cartesian coordinate system, the three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system, up until now, and that's what we'd like to talk about is, in some situations, it's either useful or necessary to talk about other systems. So the two other systems I'll mention come in this last section of Chapter 14. In Cartesian coordinates, if you have a point in three space, hanging out here, let's call it P. Well, we, we took the rectangular or Cartesian approach, and that is if you want to get from the origin to the point P, you do it in a kind of a roundabout way. You come down here, X units. You then come over to the projection of P. That's usually called P prime, I think, in your book which will be y units, and then you walk up to p z units, and you find yourself <coughs> at p following those rectangular directions. First x, I shouldn't put an arrow there, I guess it's not really a vector anymore. Go x units this way, y units this way, z units this way, and you're where you want to be. And that's where all of our surfaces over here were developed in terms of distances and what have you in x, y, and z. Now, you might recall that we talked about polar coordinates not too long ago. That's in 2D, two dimensions, in the x, y plane. If you had a point out here, let's again call it P prime, then in terms of x and y coordinates, it has coordinates x this way, y this way, but it also had the polar coordinates in terms of this angle theta and this distance r from the origin, r can be a positive or negative value, theta described counterclockwise with respect to the x-axis. In terms of those polar coordinates, we would describe the process as stand here at the origin, look down the x-axis, turn yourself theta units, whatever they may be, degrees or radians, and march out to the point R units. If R happens to be negative, while you're facing that way, you march backwards to the, the point in question. So what we can do is basically superimpose that in this system as well. That is, down here in the xy plane, rather than use x and y, we can introduce our R and theta just as well. So that point P up there, 
could be gotten to by looking down the x-axis, turning theta units, marching out our units to p prime, the projection in the xy plane, and then again going up z units to get to the point p. Now this is going to be a little confusing because here I've written one thing, here I've written a number, another. Uh, if you see a, a problem with some numbers in that particular triple, you're never too sure whether is that a polar triple or is that a Cartesian triple or what. So unless the, the notation makes it clear, I'm going to have to specify, well, those numbers refer to a, a polar coordinate system. Now with polar coordinates down here and the extra dimension thrown in, that's called cylindrical coordinates. So there's the new coordinate system, or one of the new coordinate systems that I wanted to get into today, something called cylindrical coordinates. Why are they called cylindrical coordinates? For example, there are surfaces, just like in, in Cartesian coordinates, it might look something like this. Let me, again, give you a quick review. We did this about two lessons ago. In Cartesian coordinates, x equals 2, we found out was an important thing. It was a plane uh, perpendicular to the x-axis, two units <coughs> out. Okay, now, if you hold one of the polar coordinates or the cylindrical coordinate variables constant, what kinds of things do you get there? Same kinds of questions. So if you let r equal 2, what does that mean? It's the surface consisting of all points p with polar coordinates and the z giving you cylindrical coordinates so that r equals 2, theta is anything you want, and z is anything you want. Much like the rectangular coordinate problem, if you just hold x fixed, then y and z were free to ch move around. That gave you the plane. And here, if you hold r fixed, well, actually, you can let theta and z be any value as well. Well, what kind of a surface is that? r equals a constant. Someone suggests a sphere. Okay, and someone suggests a cylinder. Well, we can't have both. Let's take a look at it first in 2D just in the xy plane, r equals 2, we should recall from not too long ago, is in fact a circle <coughs> of radius 2, the, the idea being that we're talking about a point in polar coordinates where the radial distance is constant, but the angular aspect, the theta, is any variable that you like. So as long as you make any angle whatsoever with respect to the x-axis and you're two units out, you're on that particular curve in two space. So there you have fixed r, variable theta, and now I'm also tossing in free of charge a variable z. Now that kind of sounds like what we did last time. If you have a variable z, that means this circle is extended up and back behind the blackboard. In other words, a point's on the surface if and only if its projection is back here in the circle. So if you want to draw a three-dimensional picture of that, not too bad. As it turns out, here's the circle that we were talking about down in the xy plane. And to continue this problem, one then adds these kinds of things, I guess. Here is the picture I had above, two units out any angle theta. Here's the projection of the point, but the point itself with coordinates p, 2, theta, z, any point of that form would work as long as its projection down here is two units from the origin. That, if you look at it for a while, I'm not going to get into it in any detail, would give you a cylinder if you looked at it in terms of a picture. If you didn't look at it in terms of a picture, you might also remember that r was in terms of Cartesian coordinates, radical x squared plus y squared. So we're talking about a surface which is in Cartesian coordinates, radical x squared plus y squared equals 2, or x squared plus y squared equals 4. 
So either with the algebra, the equivalence of coordinate systems, or with the geometry over here, and I hope with both, hope you're all capable of doing both, in fact, you'll find out that this, in fact, is a cylinder, a right circular cylinder. And I guess that's as good a reason as any to call this cylindrical coordinates, because r equals a constant turns out to be a right circular <coughs> cylinder of some sort. Now, some of your problems are, in fact, of this type. They'll say, graph or describe this particular surface in free space. A corresponding question, once we've done that one, would be, how about theta is a constant? Let's say theta equals pi over 4. Well, that means, again, r could be anything, and z could be anything. You have radial and altitude, radial distance and altitude free to choose. What's specified is the angle alone. So if we came over and, and again, looked at 2d, theta equals pi over 4, what would that be? Right. If theta equals pi over 4, we're talking about all those points in 2D so that the angle with respect to the x-axis that they make is constantly pi over 4. Here, radial distance is anything. Could be 0, in fact. Could be a negative 1, negative 5, whatever. But importantly, all you have is the fact that that angle is true. Now, extend this out in the z-direction, that's free. And what are you going to have? <coughs> a plane, right. So theta equals pi over 4 turns out to be a plane in 3 space. And why? Well, if you take a point on this plane, it's going to have coordinates r, pi over 4, and z in cylindrical coordinates. The only thing specified is that angle with respect to the x-axis. The easy question is, what z equals a constant? <coughs> that gets us back to Cartesian coordinates. z equals a constant would be a horizontal plane, constant distance away from the origin. So those tell you what the basic shapes are holding any one of the variables constant. Now, I mentioned here that there are some algebraic equivalences that we ought to be aware of. And of course, they again go back to your polar coordinate system. So let me remind you what that was in this picture right here. You may recall that this distance x is, in fact, here's x right here, is r cosine theta. This leg of the triangle, hypotenuse r, here's your adjacent angle theta. And the opposite side, which would be y, would give you r sine theta. That was in polar coordinates. z doesn't change, so it's pretty much of a review. That is, x is r cosine theta, y r sine theta, and z equals z. There's no change there. And going in the other direction, we would have, of course, r is plus minus radical x squared plus y squared. Tan theta is y over x, and z equals z. There's no change there. So that's how you get from one system to another. A few of your problems are, well, given a point in Cartesian coordinates, find out what it is in polar or cylindrical coordinates, and vice versa. We'll take a look at those problems. But let me warn you, I guess for about the umpteenth time, that you have to be careful in your choices right here. You have to be careful in your choices of plus the square root and the appropriate angle. Let me give you a situation.
let's assume that you have in Cartesian coordinates this point right out here. Cartesian, the coordinates are minus 1x plus 1y, let's say plus 2z. So we go back one unit that way, go right one unit in the positive y direction, and then go up two units in the positive <coughs> z direction. Now the question is, what would that be in terms of polar coordinates? And therefore, in terms of cylindrical coordinates. So we introduce that radial distance there. It's obvious that this is a 1, 1 square root of 2 right triangle. It's also obvious that uh, this angle is, uh, is something or other. So the question is, in polar coordinates, and therefore in cylindrical coordinates, what are you going to fill in for that angle theta? What's going to go right there? Well, a lot of people come over and say, gee, it says here tangent theta is y over x. <coughs> and y in this case is plus 1. x is minus 1. So I get a minus 1 out of all of that. Throw it in my calculator. Tan inverse of minus 1 gives you a minus pi over 4. So without thinking too hard, somebody will throw in a negative pi over 4. And that's wrong. And I hope you can see that from the picture. If you put in a negative pi over 4, that says, well, actually, you go 45 degrees this way, minus pi over 4, and you go out square root of 2 units and up 2, you're certainly not anywhere near the point that you were after. You're in absolutely the wrong quadrant down in the xy plane. And your big mistake was right here. If you do this, just using your calculator where you get principal values of inverse tangents will possibly lead you to the wrong angle in the wrong quadrant, and obviously real off, real, really far off in terms of the point itself. So be careful you're making these kinds of choices, make sure you make the corresponding choice. If you want minus pi over 4, that's fine, but make sure you use a negative square root of 2 so that as you're pointing out this way, you actually back up into the point projection that you want. So make sure you get the, the appropriate pair of angle and sign there. So you just find, up, find yourself in the wrong place. Now using this kind of a relationship that you see here, one can then go on and look at various surfaces in terms of cylindrical coordinates. More examples, uh, let's see, z squared is 4 minus r squared. Typical question, might even be one of your homeworks, I forget. What is that surface? Well, possibly you can draw it, but I think this is a good time to throw in our algebraic arsenal, look at these kinds of relationships. R squared we know is x squared plus y squared, and without doing a whole lot of sketching, which often doesn't pay off, doesn't always pay off anyway, one can find that this, this surface up here is equivalent to this one down here. Can you recognize that one in Cartesian coordinates? Sphere. That's a sphere, right. Sphere of Radius 2, center at the origin. And some of your problems will have you go the other direction. Given the Cartesian equation, you can fairly easily see we can dump in an R squared there and get ourselves back here. Now, it's not just a, an exercise in the true sense of exercise of making you do some of this just to get familiar with it. That's true, but it's also true that later on, in particular in Calc 3 again, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a carrot as well, in Calc 3 you'll find that in certain problems it will be best that you describe a sphere in terms of cylindrical coordinates. The reason is, uh, a classic problem in fact, is that you take a sphere and drill a 
cylindrical hole through the middle. The question is either how much volume have you drilled out or how much volume is left. Well, as a volume problem, this would be really nice to do in cylindrical coordinates. That's the shape of the hole that you have. So if you're going to do that cylinder in cylindrical coordinates, then it'd be best that you use cylindrical coordinates for the sphere. And this problem becomes quite easy then. So there are more reasons for this than maybe first meet your eye. Uh, how about these things over here that we talked about? Ellipsoids, of course, a sphere. This one right here is a special case of an ellipsoid. You might have something like this, v equals uh, r squared. What's that surface? Same trick. These are fairly trivial relationships. Yours aren't much more difficult than your problem. If you plug in for r, you'll have something like that. Anybody recognize that thing? V equals x squared plus y squared. Notice the parabola, parabola, both of them pointing up. In my mind, when I see that equation, you know, I actually see the traces. And I see the paraboloid. Z equals r squared turns out to be a paraboloid. Uh, how about z squared equals r squared? If you solve, if z equals plus minus <coughs> r, that'd be one thing to do. Or, pardon me, you could also replace it as we've done up here. We've got z squared is x squared plus y squared. And in Cartesian coordinates, you might notice what that is. Turns out to be a cone. So our, our quadric surfaces over here, not only should you know them fairly well in terms of Cartesian coordinates, but you ought to be able to manipulate them into cylindrical coordinates for purposes, again, that may not be so apparent. Well, I don't know. If you've done some polar coordinate problems, I'll anticipate that you probably can do pretty well on these. What I would like to do is get into the next coordinate system, the last that we see in this course anyway. That, again, is a, a real handy tool if you have problems of a certain s sort. So let's start all over again. Perhaps you could just add it to the picture you had originally. Here's my point P out here origin, the projection of P down here. We talked about Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so those would be the numbers you'd use in Cartesian coordinates. We talked about the cylindrical coordinates. Throw in your radius, R, and this angle theta. And the last thing we're going to do is uh, what you call spherical coordinates. And I guess you could think of spherical coordinates as being the most efficient system. And that is, if I wanted to go from O to P, personally, I'd rather just go straight line. No need to take any side excursions. And that's pretty much what spherical coordinates are all about. You stand here at the origin, and you look up at the point that you're trying to get to, and you describe how you get to that point in terms of straight, a straight line path. Well, obviously, the first thing you ought to tell someone is, I'm going to go from O out to P a certain number of units. How far do I have to go? Well, that would be the length of that orange line segment right there. But of course, uh, that's not the whole story. That just tells me how far away P is, straight line distance. I still have to designate it as being that point right up there. And the way we're going to do that is to also use this angle theta as a designator. Gives you kind of a direction for at least the projection down here. And the other thing, in fact, it's the new thing, is this angle with respect to the z-axis. This is called a phi. I usually make them like that. Your book makes them a little bit differently, one or the other. That's a Greek lowercase phi, and uh, that turns out to be the third coordinate in the spherical coordinate system. Let's put down all the possibilities over here. Get the 
kind of wrap it up. We had Cartesian. We had cylindrical. And we also have spherical. Try to give you some common colors there so you can see some of the relationships. So it's the same theta as in cylindrical, but now we have a row and a peak in Cartesian as well. Now what would happen if I again started looking at surfaces? How about rho equals two? What kind of a surface would that be? All points where the first coordinate is constant phi is free, theta is free, what do you get out of all of that? The only specification is that the distance from the origin is 2. What kind of a surface would that be? All points is distance, distances are 2. Sphere, right. And of course, that's why it's called spherical coordinates. If you hold that coordinate cons constant, you get a sphere. If phi is constant and you let rho and theta be whatever, what do you think then? For example, right here, any rho is possible, any angle around the z-axis is possible, cone, good. If you hold phi equal to a constant, you'll get a cone, something that just wraps around a constant angle with respect to the z-axis. I, I guess I should throw it down, but we've done it already. If you let theta equal a constant, let's say pi over 4, that means that uh, any phi rho pair is a possibility we get the plane again. And I believe a few of your problems are of that type in spherical coordinates, what's true about uh, these particular kinds of equations. Now before we get into anything more involved, what we should do is realize the, the relationship between the various coordinate systems. We've seen Cartesian cylindrical. Let's see what's true about the spherical as well. And to do that justice, let me reproduce a couple of triangles that aren't so well drawn here by the perspective. Looking down in the xy plane, we have that point P prime, the projection of P. And as I've drawn it here, we have this radial distance R and this angle theta. And we've looked at that before in terms of polar coordinates. Now let's look at this triangle right here. It's got the orange hypotenuse. Goes up to P prime from O. Uh, we have it dropping down in white and here's R on the bottom. So that's in that particular plane, the plane theta equals that constant. So what do we know? Let's throw in just about everything we know now. And this distance here is Y. That's R sine theta. This distance is x, which is r cosine theta. Okay. This distance here was z. And now let's see what is true with respect to our spherical coordinates. Rho is that straight line distance, the hypotenuse. And the angle phi 
is with respect to the z-axis. There's our angle T there. Now let's uh, just do a quick shift here. That's going to be the same angle T that you see over here. And so now I can get, for example, the z-coordinate is the adjacent side for the phi angle in this triangle. Hypotenuse is rho, so that means that z is rho cosine phi. That's a new one for us. That gives z a Cartesian coordinate or a cylindrical coordinate in terms of rho and phi. Okay. In the same way, this other leg, of course, would be r sine phi, opposite side of that angle. That in itself, pardon me, not r, rho. That in itself isn't so important. Other than that, I can use up here and get my other relationships for x and y. For example, y up here is going to be r, which is rho sine phi, cosine theta. So there's my y coordinate. And my x coordinate is r, again, rho sine phi, cosine theta. And I got it written down wrong, didn't I? Which is an sine up here. So that allows me to take, for example, spherical coordinates and transform them directly into Cartesian coordinates. If you wanted to go the other way, you still have some problems, but basically what you'll see in the book are things like rho is plus minus radical x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That's just your distance from the origin formula, which is what rho is all about, of course. A theta is the same thing as before. Tan theta is y over x. And I think your book tends to use this relationship right here and get phi in terms of z and rho. Uh, cosine phi is z over rho. My sage piece of advice is choose wisely. You still have the problem of plus minus signs corresponding with correct thetas and correct phi's. It's kind of a mess, but I think for most of your problems, the best thing you can do is to draw a picture and you won't run into trouble. You'll see the obvious angles before you. Let's take a look at a couple of those kinds of problems. Again, from your lesson assignment sheet, page 673, number 3A. Okay, I think we're given Cartesian coordinates 1, 1, <coughs> minus 2 square roots of 2. And I'm going to transform those into both cylindrical and spherical. I forget which one you're supposed to do, but let's do both anyway. So if it's Cartesian 1, 1, minus 2 square roots of 2, we come one unit down x-axis across one unit in the y direction and then drop a negative 2 square roots of 2 in the z direction. There's our point P. Here's our point P prime. But if we go into cylindrical, What we're going to need is r, theta, and z. That's kind of a freebie right there. The z is exactly the same. The question is, what's the radial distance and the angle theta for, don't forget, the projection phi prime? We stick into the, the xy plane in order to get that. Well, this is obviously a 1, 1 square root of 2 right triangle. So you can just read that off if you like. The 
alternative is to use your algebraic equality, which says r is radical x squared plus y squared, plus or minus, but in this case, obviously take plus, as long as you realize that the angle that would correspond to that would be 45 degrees or pi over 4. If you chose some other angle, then perhaps negative square root of 2 would have been more appropriate. So that was pretty easy. Let's see what we can do for spherical. Rho phi theta. I might mention that there's some question about which order these two go in. Even within your book, I tend to reverse them myself. And I was checking over, I think it was even this homework problem. I was pretty sure I had the right answer, but the answer in the back was the other way around. So if you think you've got the right answer, it's very possibly that that's the mistake that was made. Now to do this problem, of course, theta is the same. So that, in a sense, is free. We still have to figure out the angle phi. We still have to figure out rho. I think this is a good time for you to sketch this second picture that we had in your problems. or as you often do anyway, religiously follow the algebra and just hope it works out somehow. I don't think that's always a good idea. But in this picture over here, here's our square root of 2 coming out at us. We drop down from p prime to p, a negative 2 square roots of 2 units. And the distance we're interested in from origin to point would be that hypotenuse right there. Well, the angle we need is this one for phi. And the distance we need is that hypotenuse for rho. So I think if you look at the triangle, it's pretty easy to see. If you sum the squares of these two things, you get 2 plus 8, 10. Square root would be square root of 10. So we've got that one pegged. And how about that angle? Well, it's not a famous one. That's the trouble. So this is where you might want to fall back, as I suggested, to this equation right here. Cosine of the angle is z over rho. So phi would be the inverse cosine of phi over rho. In this case, uh, let's just put it over here. That would be the yeah, z, pardon me inverse cosine of z over rho, in this case, would be inverse cosine of minus 2 square roots of 2 divided by square root of 10. I'll leave it to your calculator to figure out what that is. I think the back of the book has those two switched. And uh, I might have, well, I forgot to mention, but I, I think it should be apparent now, maybe after you've done a few of these problems, that theta can be any angle whatsoever, but we tend to let rho be only a positive number. Not always, but I think most books like to stick with a, a positive rho, non negative rho. And again, to make life less complicated, the tendency is to always let the angle phi between 0 and pi, so you don't get multiple wraparounds in those directions as well. Okay. Any questions on that one? It's uh, not terribly exciting, but that's what they look like. A few of your other problems are of the ones we well, of the type we've looked at a little bit, and that is, what is this particular surface? You pick out a few, for example, number 14, nice and easy, as it turns out. I think it's rho equals secant phi. What is that?
so like our cylindrical coordinates, one can either try to sketch it or if you, uh, if you just play around with it algebraically, perhaps something will come up. Let me suggest the algebraic thing that suggested itself to me. Obviously, we don't have many relationships over here that involve secant, so let me change that secant to a 1 over cosine and then pops into my view this idea, rho cosine phi is 1. Well, rho cosine phi is always a z-coordinate. So what looked like a rather fancy looking surface up here is nothing more than a nice flat plane down here. z equals 1 horizontal plane, 1 unit above the xy plane. Okay, problem 19. is something of a strange one. There are a few of them in there. Let me throw you that one. That looks uh, unduly complicated. It's quadratic and row. But if you do anything, perhaps this might be one of the things. And if you've done that, then what you've established is that rho is equal equal 1 or rho equals 2. And we just talked about what rho equals a constant. This would both, these both would be spheres. And you, you could answer it as two concentric spheres, one of radius 1 and one of radius 2. So there's some rather complicated looking things that you can describe fairly easily in spherical coordinates. In terms of what you're going to use spherical coordinates for, well, other than longitude and latitude when you get into some navigation problems, um, for the most part, you're pretty much stuck with spherical problems. I would say in Calculus 3, spherical coordinates has a fairly limited application. In other courses, that's not true, but in Calc 3 where you're dealing with volumes and masses and stuff, you really have to have a sphere and almost nothing but a sphere in order to get a decent problem work easily. A uh, classic case would be looking ahead for some of you, what if I now cut a conical hole, say, of that shape out of my sphere? Well, a <coughs> cone is easy to describe. That would be phi equal to some constant. Uh, and uh, if I had drawn it differently, I would have written down, oh, okay, let me draw it differently. As long as I get to make up the problem, let me make it easy. Let's drill our conical hole right to the center of the thing. So let's try the whole thing again. Okay, the cone's supposed to be there at the center. That's really more like an ice cream cone because you've taken off the cap of the sphere as well. What if you drill that part out? What's left or how much have you removed? Well, the nice thing is that you can describe the cone as phi equals some angle like pi over 4. It's a nice, nice uh, cut. You can also describe your sphere easily as rho equals some constant, let's say 2, as we talked about before. And so with very simple statements about what the surfaces are, you can make some very simple calculations as to what volumes and what have you are as well. If you didn't do it that way, of course, you'd be stuck in Cartesian coordinates with things like z squared is x squared plus y squared. And down here, you've got z squared plus x squared plus y squared equals 4. And to deal with those things in a Cartesian problem really can be uh, tough or almost impossible in some situations, whereas the spherical setup is almost trivial. So use them as a good tool. That's all I can say. Uh, but for spherical coordinates, the usefulness is somewhat limited. That's it for Chapter 14. Coming back for the last stand, and about the last thing we're going to do in this course is vectors again. And rather than talk about vectors v, which just kind of sit there and don't do much, we're going to talk about vectors that are, for example, functions of time. And as time goes on, they shrink and expand and change direction, all kinds of glorious things. So we're getting into vectors as a representation of some dynamic systems. So try to finish up the chapter, and we'll push off towards the end here next time. We'll see you.